the top as the most important or the most valuable or the things that I really wanted to do, what would those things be if I knew that it was my last 40? Which then raised another question. Why can't I live my life now the way that I wish I would live in my last 40 days? Does that make sense? Why can't I live now for the things that I think are most valuable that I would think about at the end of my life? So that's actually what this sermon series is about. We asked a number of our, our friends questions of, hey, what, what would be the most important thing to you if it was your last 40? You know, and obviously there's, there's some things that in your last 40 days, you might not do it now for logistic reasons. But one of our friends said, uh, if it was my last 40 days, I'd go buy a really good life insurance plan. <laughs> you know, um, that was funny. You guys, you guys are tired. That's the only joke I planned today. So you're not going to laugh much more after this. So you, too bad for you. All right. But, but in all seriousness, it was really fun to see, though, what people said about what was really important to them. And then as we looked at what they said to us, we realized as you look at the life of Jesus as he walked with his disciples, Jesus was constantly inviting his disciples into that kind of life, a life of purpose, a life of meaning, a life of significance. Um, Jesus put it this way once, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So we're going to talk about in this series, how do we have life to the full during these 40 days? So let me pray for us. And then we're going to get into our story for today. Father in heaven, thank you for this sacred space. We pray, Holy Spirit, that as I speak, that you would take control of my heart, my mind, and my words, and you would allow me to speak graciously and kindly and truthfully your word. Father, for myself and for all of us, I pray for an open heart. And whatever you want to accomplish within each of us this morning, we pray that you would do so, so your name would be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. It was starting to get late. Jesus had been teaching the crowds all day. And then he looked over to his disciples and said, hey, guys, let's get in the boat and cross the sea. Now, the sea they were about to cross was the Sea of Galilee. And many of the disciples were fishermen. And they had been on the sea time and time and time again. Now, these fishermen knew that the Sea of Galilee was a very unique body of water. The Sea of Galilee sits roughly 680 feet below sea level. It has kind of a subtropical climate. It's a little warmer, a little humid. But surrounding the Sea of Galilee, you have mountains and you have hills. Particularly on the west side, you have mountains that raise to 2,000 feet, where it's cool and it's dry. And as fishermen, they knew there was a serious danger on the Sea of Galilee. If dry, cold wind from the mountains would blow down to the sea and hit the hot humid air, that hot humid air would come up and it would start to create type of a circle, right? This is kind of how a tornado or a hurricane would be formed. Cold air coming down, warm air. And what would happen on the Sea of Galilee, you had a tremendous potential for extremely violent storms that happened over a very short period of time. On top of that, the Sea of Galilee is relatively not that deep. It's only 200 feet deep. So the Sea of Galilee can't absorb energy very, very well. So it just gets really rough and it gets pretty crazy. So as Jesus says, let's go across the lake, these fishermen kind of know, hey, this is our area. Now it's at nighttime. And at nighttime, it's actually one of the safest places to go. So I imagine that as the fishermen went out, they checked the wind, they said it was nighttime, and they said, okay, this is a good time to go. Let's go, Jesus. So they take out. Now, one of the practices that a fisherman in that day would have regularly done, when fishermen in the Sea of Galilee go out, they go out, they use their oars, they'd row out, and then every once in a while, they would pause and get totally still. They would even rest their, rest their head on the oar, and they would just listen. And they would listen for a sign of wind. And if there was a sign or a sound of wind, if they could figure out that it was coming over the mountains, you know what they would do? They would turn around and go in. Because if that wind kept coming, it would get really bad really quick. As a fisherman, you would never, ever get caught in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, unable to get to shore if the wind was coming. So these fishermen went out. And when they were out, though, when they finally got to the middle, something really bizarre happens, because it usually doesn't happen at night, but it happened this time. 
the wind started to come over the mountains. And as the wind came over the mountains and it hit the air above the Sea of Galilee, it started to go like this. And really, really quick, you started to have a huge storm. You had rain. You had swells that started turning over. And the disciples are in the boat. By the way, Jesus, he's sleeping. But the disciples are at the oars, and they're just trying to keep the boat from going over. They're working hard. They're working as a team. But even as they're working hard, the scriptures say that the water was crashing over the boat. So even if the boat is up, the boat is getting lower and lower and lower. And they realize, if this keeps going on, we're probably going to die. And we're probably going to drown. The scriptures say that they were absolutely terrified. Have any of you ever been close to death? Or maybe had a face-to-face -face encounter with death? I've talked to a lot of you. I know that many of you have. Sometimes it might be a, a diagnosis of some sort, a car accident, a motorcycle accident, a hiking accident, all sorts of things, right? But there's also these other moments in life. Perhaps we have a loved one who passes away or a loved one who gets really sick. But there's all these things that happen in our lives that remind us that life really is short. Truly, we are mortal beings. There's a story, and it goes like this. There was once a rich and mighty Persian who walked in his garden with one of his servants. The servant cried that he had just encountered death, who had threatened him. So the servant begged his master to give him his fastest horse so that he could make haste and flee to Tehran, which he could only reach that same evening, which he could reach that same evening. The master consented, and the servant galloped off on the horse. On returning to his house, the master himself met death, and he questioned death. Why did you terrify and threaten my servant? Death said, I did not threaten him. I only showed surprise in still finding him here when I planned to meet him tonight in Tehran. Death is inevitable, isn't it? You can't outrun it. You can't escape it. The Bible, on a fairly regular basis, reminds us that life truly is short. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says that we are like grass that withers. In James chapter 4, uh, James writes, we are like a mist here today and gone tomorrow. In Psalm 102, it says, my days are like an evening shadow. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, we're going to talk about death. I don't like to talk about death. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't like to think about death either. If I'm really honest about it, it makes me a little uncomfortable. And just the thought of dying is, can be slightly terrifying to me. But you know what? Do you know that the scripture actually invites us to think about death? Let me show you a couple spots here. This is Psalm 39, written by a man named David. And David says this, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Then some years later, David's son Solomon wrote these words. A wise person thinks much about death, while the fool thinks only about having a good time now. You see, in the story this morning, what Jesus is doing is he's inviting his disciples to face death and to think about it. Now think about a storm for a moment. If you've ever been on a lake where there's a storm, when the storm comes and the storm passes, if you ever look in the water, what you will notice is the water's not clear. It's full of all sorts of junk that's turned up. If you maybe walk on the ocean after a storm, you'll see there's all sorts of shells and maybe other trash that's come up in the turning of the ocean, right? Well, thinking about death has kind of a similar idea. When we think about death, as the scriptures invite us to do, it's like a storm that begins to churn up things in our soul. Why? So that we can look at those things and we can deal with those things. Now, I want to go to our story and I want to see what this storm churns up in the souls of the disciples. This time we'll just read it to you, or I'll just read it to you. Matthew chapter 4, 
verse 37 through 41. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So there's a couple things you'll see that the storm turns up inside of their souls. First is this. When they come face to face with death, they quickly learn, they've probably already known this, that they're terrified of death. Jesus says, why are you so afraid? But the second thing that comes up, the thing that sits below their fear of death is a question. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus, don't you care? You see, this is the question that I think actually sits below most of our fears. Whether you have the fear of losing a job or a business, the fear of losing your family, the fear of losing your children, the fear of losing your significance, or whatever that might be, sits this little question, Jesus, do you really care? Now, how does this text answer the question for the disciples? Does Jesus care? Absolutely. A resounding yes, right? And it's not even, and this text goes beyond. It's not just that Jesus wakes up and says, yeah, I do care. Jesus says, yes, I care. And then he stands up and with a word, it's quiet. The wind and the storm stop. Only with a word. So Jesus says, yes, I do care. And by the way, I have the power to take care of even this situation. And then he says to them, so why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Another word for faith is the word trust. It's, as Jesus, it's like Jesus looks and just says, hey, you guys, do you trust me? Guys, do you trust me? Because I got you. Even as you look death in the eye, don't be afraid. I got you. Trust me. You know, there's a little bit of irony in this story. You know, first they're afraid by the storm. And you think maybe after Jesus calms the storm, it would say, then the disciples had peace. But instead, what does it say? It says they were terrified. The storm made them afraid, but then Jesus made them afraid. But they're very different kinds of fear, aren't they? Like the first fear was rooted in the sense of they don't have control, and they were focusing on the power of the storm, the power of the storm to drown them, to take their life. See, fears like that have the ability to cripple us, don't they? And so in that type of fear, we simply, we try to control it or we try to avoid it. But the second type of fear they have is slightly different. Because in the second fear, they're no longer afraid of the situation is the thing that has the power. They've recognized that the one who controls the situation has the power. And so the second fear is rooted in the one who is good and the one who has ultimate control. You know, one time later, when Jesus was preparing his disciples to go out and to preach the good news, he knew that they would have fierce opposition. I mean, they knew that, or Jesus knew that they would be persecuted, some of them would be killed. And Jesus told them this in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. But then look what he says. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus says, hey, when you guys go out 
and they threaten to kill you, you can say to them, wait, that's the best you got? You're, you're going to kill me? That's the best you can do? Because when you kill me, guess what? I belong to my Father in heaven, and I am so valuable to him as he looks at the little sparrow, and he cares for the sparrow. He cares so much for me. He knows, he, he cares for me so much, he knows how many hairs are on my head. So Jesus says, do not be afraid. You can face any situation because at the end of the day, you know that Jesus, do you care? And the answer is yes. There's a one scripture in the book of Revelation that is particularly meaningful to me. Revelations 1.18. And Jesus says this, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death in Hades. Death cannot hold us anymore because Jesus has authority over death. It's good news. There's no reason to fear death when we know who death belongs to. Now, I had this friend. His friend's uh, Steve Tolson. He, I, I, I can't say is, he was the pastor at a church called Centennial Covenant Church in Colorado. He pastored for over 30 years. Uh, Amanda served under him at Centennial while we were at Denver Seminary. And he's been a mentor and a friend to us. And when we went back to midwinter a few weeks ago, we had the pleasure of going to one of his last services before he was retiring from his time being with Centennial Covenant Church. And after the service, I talked to him a little bit and said, Steve, like, what's it like for you? You're almost done. And he looked at me. Steve, is, he's, he's tall, so he's looking down at me. And he's got this beautiful white beard and white hair and just this very gentle spirit, you know. He looks down, kind of does this, and he gets, he gets a little smirk on his face, a little joy. And he goes, you know, it's been really good. I told the church, as you hear my last sermons, that I'm finally going to tell you what I really think about things. <laughs> what are you going to do, fire me? <laughs> and, but, it wasn't this, but it wasn't this like... You know, it wasn't this mean, it wasn't a mean-spirited thing. It was just this light-hearted, joyful peace thing. And he goes, yeah, it's kind of the joke in the office right now. Like, we do things, I just, you know, I just say, what are you going to do? Fire me? And then everybody has this light little chuckle. There's this, because Steve knows that retirement is coming, he can't stop it. He's going to be taken care of. He just lives with this light-heartedness and this light joy. You see, that's, that's where I think the scripture wants to bring us when it asks us to think about death. Because what the scriptures want to do is not only invite us to face death, but to say, you belong to the one who cares. And when this truth sinks deep into your soul, then you can be like Pastor Steve. A little peace, a little joy, and a beautiful lightheartedness. So this sermon, I called Invitation to Face Your Fears. This morning, when I was kind of wrapping things up, I thought I probably named it wrong. I probably should have named it Invitation to be Free from Your Fears, or perhaps Invitation to Fear Him instead of Your Fears. But I was thinking my hope is that this morning, as we look at death face to face, everyone in this room would know how much they matter to God, and that this truth would sink down and bring a lightheartedness and a freedom to you. Now, this sermon series is called 40 Days, and we're talking about living the life that we would like to live in our last 40 days, not just then, but now. I want to read you a quote from a book that I was reading uh, from a pastor who was making some observations about, uh, who was working as a chaplain, working with people who were going to die, but he made this observation, he wrote it down here. I'd like to read it to you, and it says this, people towards the end of life are willing to take risks and face their fears. The fear of death puts other fears in perspective. People facing the end of their lives are forced to recognize their powerless and limitations. The weaker they get, the more they have to depend on others to take care of them. And at the end of the day, they know, much, they know that much of their lives is out of their control. Ultimately, they're forced to turn to God. The ironic thing is that when we, they finally stop struggling and rely on his strength, they discover real power to live the rest of their lives to the fullest. 
Wouldn't it be beautiful if we didn't have to wait till the end of our lives to fully learn to trust and to depend on God? Now, I was thinking about this a lot, and we can't get too much into perhaps all the different types of fears, but it does seem if you could, if you could pinpoint perhaps the greatest fear, it, it might be the fear of death, the fear that sits below everything else. And it does seem that if you can, if you are able to look at death face to face, if you can think about your own mortality, but alongside of that, be able to say, but I have confidence and security in Christ, it's going to change the rest of your life. So what can you do with this? I just have some thoughts. Not a lot here, but we'll end with this. I am a person who does not like to think about death. Probably most of us are like that. But I also know it's really important to do things that remind us that death is going to happen, right? Sometimes it's helpful to come to an Ash Wednesday service where we put the ashes on our forehead and we're reminded from the dust God made us and to the dust our bodies will return. Sometimes, sometimes it's good just to stop and to think about it as much as you may not like to, but think about the fact that death is coming. Sometimes, you know, we have this thing, I have, I have this problem too, like we do so many things to try and stay young, don't we? I mean, we dye our hair, we, we exercise, we try and, you know, wear clothes that, that make us look younger. But we do all these things to avoid getting old. Maybe what we need to do is just be okay with the fact. Learn to be okay. I'm getting gray hair. That's cool. I'm losing my hair. That's cool. My body's slowing down. That's okay. That's simply a part of life. Something, and maybe this is more of a guy thing than a girl thing, because guys, I realize we don't, we're not always in touch with our emotions. But we all go through loss. Why are you laughing? Do you think I'm not in touch with my emotions? That's my wife. Man, I'm very in touch with my emotions. Um, <laughs> but, but sometimes when we go through loss, people deal with it differently. Some people, when they lose someone they love, they just kind of set it to the side and go on through life like nothing ever happened. Just kind of the, hey, I'm okay. I'm strong. But sometimes the reason that we don't want to face this loss for what it is, is we're, we're afraid because it reminds us of the fact that someday we're going to die too. And so if you have had a loss, like step into the loss and then guys, it's okay to cry, but go through the pain and go through the sorrow because when we go to that place and we allow ourselves to interact with the possibility of death, then in a very deep way, we can have Jesus speak to us. Jesus, do you care? Yes, I care. And by the way, I hold the keys to death. Revelations 1.18, one more time, because it's that good. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. My prayer for you this morning is that you would go out with great confidence, that you could face your fears because Jesus holds you. Now, I don't know all of your stories here this morning. Maybe you're here, maybe church is a new thing and you're here just to check it out. And you're saying, wait, that sounds great, but how can I have this confidence that you're talking about? It's very simple. When Jesus came to this earth, he said that all who believe me shall not perish, but they will have eternal life. Jesus didn't come to set up a religious system that would make it really hard for you to know him. Jesus came to show us how much he loves us. And he says simply this, all you need to do is turn to me and put your trust in me. And if you put your trust in me, you can count on the fact I will hold you from this day for the rest of your life. So church, as we go out, let's go out with that confidence in the love of God who holds the keys to death and Hades. With that, let's pray, and then we'll prepare to go this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for my brothers and my sisters here that I get to journey with, Lord. Most of us, unless you come again in our lifetime, most of us are going to die. God, I pray for all of us, though, that we would not fear death, but I pray that we would be confident as we look at death, 
because you are the one who holds the keys. And Father, for myself and for all of us, Lord, sometimes we need moments like the disciples when the water gets turned up so that the depths of our soul can come out. And Lord, that's what you need to do. We'd ask humbly that you do it. But Lord, as the stuff gets churned up, we pray that you would meet us, Lord, according to your will and according to your love and answer the question, do you care? Yes, you do. Jesus, if there are people here this morning who've never given their life to you, I pray that you would just show them how much you love them. And if you are here this morning and you've never put your trust in Jesus, I simply invite you to pray after me. Jesus, thank you that you are Lord and Savior, and I ask now that you would be my Lord and Savior. Show me how to trust you with my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're ending a little differently today. Because when I read that scripture from Luke, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body in Africa and do no more. And then he goes on to say, um, do not fear because of the spirit.